a sort of metaphor of uh, of the the very frozen relationship between them, and at the same time the relationship which is very magnificent because he compares this ice cream to Hotel de Ritz as a sort of uh, les Alpes, uh, in the Grand and in the same time it's uh, something that. Uh, um, Form yes. melts, and so uh, there is a transformation, sort of anamorphosis uh, of this uh, food into something uh, more, uh, not so rigid, but uh, but uh, uh, less, uh, uh, more, more warm and uh, easy to assimilate. So there are a lot of uh, references to uh, the uh, mouth or oral sensuality. I don't, maybe it's difficult to say that this is the basis of every kind of sensuality because we know also that uh, the tactical experience is also very um, um, archaic. Do you say that's the keen experience through, through the skin? What happens to the skin? Tactical. Tactile. But uh, 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 anyhow, the, uh, the oral link is very, very much present in, in, in this book. Was this the question? Yeah, no. yes, it was definitely a question. I guess I was struck, as well, as I'm sure as you recognize, to hear use of place names as a section and the name of one of your articles in the last few years. When you said um, uh, oral as um, you know, as the origin, mm -hmm. uh, the way that you figure the body um, time in the proof as indeed uh, metonymic, mm -hmm. it seemed that origin in that sense would not would mean something not necessarily as opposed to being well, although not this is very much the word origin, because as I uh, tried to show, this origin is always di displaced in his in Christian metaphor. But uh, if, if you uh, um, observe the things from uh, the point of view of the acquisition of the identity, you can observe that, that the oral stage is from uh, somewhere in the beginning of the, this development. So we can uh, criticize this from a philosophical point of view and say nothing is original because before uh, this mouth uh, link there are other link, uh, links. But anyhow, in the, in the memory uh, images and in the sensorial experience, uh, for instance in the psychoanalytic process, the, the, uh, the mouth and the, the oral link becomes uh, essential uh, as with every kind of inverted commas, original experience, even if it is always uh, infused in something else and displaced, etc. I, I want to say something else when uh, I was uh, listening to your question, but well, I forget, I'll come back afterwards. Two questions. The first one is whether uh, Proust found the subtext of your uh, essay on place names. Mm. And, and the second is... Uh, oh, it was about place names, yes. Uh, and the, the, the second is about George Sand again, whether... Because George Sand was considered a great writer, but writer to many other people. And whether the rejection of uh, George Sand by Proust is not part of the proposition as she was uh, as not as Yeah. Well, the first uh, well, when I wrote the essay on place names, I uh, uh, didn't have in mind Proust. I just had in mind the, observant, the, the observations we made with students of mine in the um, kindergarten with the, the children when they uh, articulate their first uh, sentences and before, even before. Uh, and when the, I noticed that uh, when they were referring to a space through uh, demonstrative pronouns, for instance, this and that, uh, what was behind, what they had in mind when you uh, asked them to explain, was the maternal body, 
So uh, uh, the, uh, the place, the maternal body, and then the name were linked in this very uh, empirical experience that we had with acquisition of language by children. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to say uh, in connection with the two questions is that, as you know, some logicians consider that the proper names um, have a, a signifier but don't have a signified. They are empty signified. Why? Because as, when I say Mary and Peter, it doesn't mean anything. There are just differences between two items but there is no content, there is no thought in it. And because of this fact, uh, they are equivalent to demonstrative pronouns, this and that. And uh, I have written something, but I don't know, it's not been, it has not been recollected in a book yet, uh, that because of this particularity of proper names, they are very uh, fruitful for uh, the imaginative exploration. Because a writer, Esprus, and we have seen this in the different quotations I gave you for Florence and uh, Parme, etc. They can feel this empty signified with different associations. And they can motivate, or, or this, or this motivate mm -hmm. the empty signifier. Uh, and this is one of maybe of the logical explanations of the fact that proper names are so are so polyphonic and full of signification in in writing, because uh, initially they don't mean anything, but because of this discrepancy, writers uh, over determine themselves, determine them. And uh, what was the second question about your song? Well, there is a profanation of, uh, of a mother because uh, Proust uh, considered that his mother's taste was a petit bourgeois and not uh, of the high uh, French society in which he wanted to integrate. But also, it was, uh, I think, uh, something more because uh, he, uh, he was uh, really very reluctant against the popular style in literature. And uh, uh, when rejecting um, uh, Georges Sand, he was also rejecting Romain Roland. There is a very interesting episode, again in this uh, uh, versions that are not published. It is very funny. Mm. He uh, uh, described um, Romain Roland as an uh, important figure in his novel, in, in the uh, avant texts of uh, La Recherche. And uh, finally, uh, Romain Roland was so, uh, he, he, he was so angry against him that uh, he decided one day uh, to, to throw away the whole Romain Roland, what he, he did. But uh, Romain Roland was a favorite uh, writer for Bloch, and uh, he asked himself, and this is on the notebook, maybe I have to throw away Bloch himself also. But fortunately, he kept Bloch and he just threw away Romain Roland. But there is, uh, I, I give this example in order to, to emphasize the fact that there is a, a particular kind of popular or democratic, or how can you describe it, aesthetics that he was very reluctant to, and uh, uh, not only on the basis of the maternal rejection, but also for some other uh, principles. Yes, of course, 
but maybe in a less uh, a proliferant way, because in the proper names you have so much syllables and uh, you can um, have a sort of uh, of dreaming which is more uh, rich than if you have just I and me, and etc. Uh, but uh, logically we have the same process, the empty signifier. But maybe, uh, in my mind, proper names are more exciting because of, of, of this uh, um, gathering of uh, uh, phonemes there, uh, consonants and vowels and things uh, that, that can uh, excite some associations that uh, are not uh, in, in the very, very strict uh, proper uh, first pronouns. First person of pronoun. Yes. You can visualize different things, of course. Uh, but but th this this uh, musical support uh, is lacking in the first person of pronoun. The first person is also orally attached to the speaking. Yes. The They're more more than now. Yeah. More colloquial. I'm sorry, how do you look at the text to the level of the kind of atmosphere of the I'm just wondering if you talk to the media by stabilization of the sentences, and we just are fleshing out this commentary section, is fleshing out of these sort of uh, initial experiences, kind of quite very uh, shifting around, but all these sensations that can emerge from the public, in order to uh, uh, cover all the masses. When I, I try to, to make a sort of uh, radiography of this, uh, uh, of this episode uh, and, and what I try to show is the process that I think is uh, uh, permanent in, in every kind of description, even in uh, the first pages of Combré or the scene of flagellation, etc. We have always this uh, uh, balancement between uh, the sensations and the stab stabilizations. But what is, uh, in my mind, very, um, I would say, didactic uh, in this episode, that we can see the process uh, in a very clear way. Uh, but uh, uh, anyhow, in a more subtle, in a more obscure, in a more confused way, it works uh, everywhere, even in Combré. It's just that it seems to be there's a kind of a gap between the end of the London and the beginning of these characters of Homer. And uh, in the middle, I think you kind of see what it represents, this gap that covers over a lot. You move it from the experience of sensation to the outcome, the words from the top of the gate, into the characters that are called. He, he's, I think uh, Spruce is a very analytical mind. He's working very intuitively, and from time to time he stops and he says, what have I done? And he tries to analyze this. And I think that in this episode we have the privilege to observe this analysis and how he, he uh, fragments his own process, which in other uh, situations works without uh, this gap explicitly given. But uh, he's aware of, of, of this gap as inherent of, of his mind. And I shall say that this gap inherent in, in, in our psyche, uh, that's why we are so, so deeply attracted by him. Because uh, as Saussure said, we, have, uh, we, we are speaking beings and there is a, a sort of uh, um, the appel sign bar, the English word, you know, between the signifier and the signified, they, they are not motivated. They're, there's a sort of abyss between the two. Uh, uh, and we can add with Freud there is another abyss which uh, goes uh, f further or deeper between the signifier, the signified, and the instinct. And 
all these three separations are inherent in our minds. Uh, so we are potentially schizophrenics, but uh, the, the everyday life accustoms us to consider these uh, two splits as, as normal, and, and you, we always cling them, make them fit together. And what, what uh, literary works do, uh, and also I think every kind of aesthetic work, musical and painting, is to make us aware uh, of this uh, three-folding uh, uh, diagram or uh, substance that is uh, building our minds. I don't know. Uh, in the after, they be announced, uh, and the title uh, will be Why Write You'll get the uh, announcements from the uh, Next week, we shall, uh, next Friday, we shall Yeah, thank you very much. So I'll see you next Friday. There was some oh I'm sorry, I, I spoke it was the end. Do you have questions? <laughs> and try to answer to uh, will be the following uh, and it's in connection of course with what I have uh, been trying to explain about uh, Christian style and particularly about his metaphor uh, last uh, week uh, giving uh, the example of uh, the concrete uh, use of metaphor in the Madeleine episode. So the question will be the following. Giving the essential part of the sensory marks that I hope I have demonstrated in the Madeleine episode in the Proustian text as a sensory experience, is it still possible to consider that the kernel or that the minimal element in Proust is the linguistic sign? And if not, what is the minimal configuration that the Proustian experience is built of? Let's first bring in mind the role uh, of sensations as they are described by Proust. And I will quote um, an expression from Proust, who says that his goal is, uh, quote, to draw forth from the shadow what I had merely felt, end of the quote. Uh, being made up of tensions, contradictions, always at a crossroads, sensations for Proust are at one and the same time, according to him, I quote again, imagination and another quote, the actual shock to my senses. Representation, says he again, and another quote, the essence of things. They are past and present. By virtue of the fact that it brings these opposites into conjunction, Sensation is, I quote, a fragment of time in the pure state, end the quote. Neither a reality nor mere solipsism, sensation exists as the interface of the world and of the self. 
Proust is endeavoring to capture in language and communicate to us an element of his very own that he calls a being, l'être, the being that had been what reborn in me. That's why I say that this sensation, this being, is an interface between the world and the self, because it's a being, but this being has been reborn in me. But takes its nourishment from, I quote, the essence of things. So it's, it has been reborn in me, but takes its nourishment from the essence of things, where, I quote, it finds its substance and its delight outside and inside, we are on the crossroad between two, as far as we're dealing with sensations. Perception of present reality is a disappointment, and only the imagination can provide lasting enjoyment in the quest for what is absent. I quote again Proust, reality had disappointed me because at the instant when my senses perceived it, my imagination, and this is very important, which is the only organ that I possess for the enjoyment of beauty, my imagination, which is the only organ that I possess for the enjoyment of beauty, could not apply itself to it, to reality. The imagination is disappointing. The imagination, uh, no, the reality is disappointing, and the imagination cannot apply to reality. In virtue of that ineluctable law which ordains that we can only imagine what is absent. So the imagination cannot apply to reality, it applies to a past experience. And the reality is always disappointing. But experience will in fact suspend the effects of this harsh law, as he says. This, uh, I repeat this law, reality has disappointed me because at the instant when my senses perceived it, my imagination, which was the only organ that I possessed for the enjoyment of beauty, could not apply itself to it in virtue of that ineluctable law that ordains that what we can only imagine, that we can only imagine what is absent. But experience, again, will in fact suspend the effects of this harsh law. Imagination will apprehend a sound in the past at the very moment when the senses are being shocked by the same sound in the here and now. From this basis, Proust's being, l'être, can be reborn. It can become actual, present and real, uh, with such a, quote, sudden shudder of happiness, that the true self, which had been thought dead, will awaken emancipated from the regime of time. I quote again, one can understand that the word death should have no meaning for him, for the narrative. Situated outside time, why should we fear the future? Because of this uh, belonging in the same moment to the present and to the past, <coughs> to the present which is disappointing and to the past which you can reach through imagination, we are, as narrator, outside time, in the pure time, which is in the same time a pure space. Let us emphasize this two-faced being which Proust seeks to name in his writing. Since it is infiltrated from the start by representation, that is to say by a legacy of representations from the past, Perception is always in a state of being stretched between the world of the present and the historical self. That is why it is bound to be quote, subjective and incommunicable. So, I quote, a certain name read in a book sometime in the past contains not only ideas but mixed in with its syllables the sunny and windy weather of the time of our reading. However anchored it may be in what goes on around us, perception is no less rooted in quote, the person that we were then. So perception is in the past and in the present. I emphasize this uh, as, far, as strongly as I can. Hence, 
There results for Proust a, a kind of synonymous connection between sensibility and thinking. I quote, it remains also faithful united, faithfully united to what we ourselves then were, and thereafter it can be felt and thought once again only by the sensibility, only by thought. It's first expression, felt and thought, sensibility or thought. When he turns his attention to this interface, past and present, sensibility and representation, Proust emphasizes one or other aspect of it in turn. Beneath signs, beneath the image, the narrator feels something irreducible. I quote, already at Combray, I used to fix before my mind for its attention some image which had compelled me to look at it, a cloud, a triangle, a church, spire, a flower, a stone, because I had the feeling that perhaps beneath these signs there lay something of a quite different kind. So beneath the signs there are something of a quite different kind. What would this be? The subject of feeling turns himself into a thinker, and some have gone so far as to see him as a Platonist. And this is the interpretation of Gilles Deleuze, for instance, the uh, great French philosopher, which is not very well known in America as Derrida is, but uh, who is, in my mind, one of the leading figures in the French theoretical life. And there is a very interesting book by Deleuze about Proust and the signs. He tries to uh, give, um, in my sense, very interesting, but not very uh, complete interpretation of Proustian uh, text, saying that it's based on signs uh, reducible to ideas. And he tries to see from that on in uh, Proust uh, a sort of uh, uh, pupil of Plato. Uh, which is, uh, in my mind, an exaggeration. Uh, and uh, one of the quotations I will, uh, will give you uh, will find out, will help us to find out that uh, the signs according to Proust are not reducible to ideas because uh, precisely there is something else in the depth beneath the signs. Uh, this is the quotation. Something of a quite different kind which I must try to discover some thought which they translated after the fashion of those hieroglyphic characters. So he thinks about a thought, but a very particular thought, which is uh, of the fashion of those hieroglyphic characters, which at first one might suppose to represent only material objects. So the interface brings together three elements, not only thought. And those three elements are the felt, the thought and the impression, which is also called hieroglyphic character or cipher. Intelligence, which goes less deep than the life, which affects us through our senses, says Puss, is nonetheless capable of extracting its spiritual meaning, he says. Confronted with these closely related aspects, the writer will have the task of what interpreting the given sensations as signs of so many laws and ideas. In his double role as one who senses and one who meditates, the writer will think through his work, aiming what to draw from forth from the shadow, what I had merely felt, this is a quotation I had begun with, to draw forth from the shadow what I had merely felt by trying to convert it into its spiritual equivalent. So between the shadow of what is felt and the, its spiritual equivalent, which is maybe the sign or the thought, Proust's novel imprints the network of its metaphors, its sentences, and its mode of narration. The shadow of the perception deepens at the same time as the equivalent, as he says, becomes more and more extensive. But is it ever a matter of one of them being sacrificed to the other? I don't think so. They always go together and we're always on the inter interface between the shadow and the spiritual equivalent. 
what it's sensed and what is represented. After these remarks, we must really recognize that the minimal unit of the Proustian text is not the word sign, but a doublet, sensation and idea, perception represented, or image made incarnate. The formal status of the signifier, which is so praised by the technicians of language now, and the materiality of the work of art in linguistic terms are not so much rejected by Proust, though his argument with what he judged to be the obscure formalism of Malarmé lends support to this hypothesis of rejecting the formal signifier. They are not so much reject this technicity of the signifier uh, as they are spontaneously reduced and logically consequent upon the subjective assertion which is Proust's own experience at the crossroads between the felt world of the present and the world of the self which belongs to the past. As we were argued already, Proust savors his sensations as providing the essence of things on the condition that they link up with the conflictual desires of his own personal history. He leads the life of one of those what transformed intelligences which had begun, become embodied in matter. This transformation of energy in which the thinker disappears and things are led out in front of us must already be seen as the writer's first move in achieving a style, says Proust in his quotation. So the first move in achieving the style is precisely to be on the crossroad between the sensation and science between this essence of things and the personal history. Proust once remarked to André Morois, my work is not microscopic, it is telescopic. And it is worth making the hypothesis that this telescoping has its psychological point of departure in an original state of disappointment, which has been powerfully surmounted by the hallucinatory capacity to reproduce the desired but lost impressions within the imagination. What impressions such as those to which I wish to give permanence could not but vanish, this is disappointment. Every uh, real experience, and I suppose the most archaic ones have been like that, will be vanishing. At the touch of a direct enjoyment which had been powerless to engender them, end of the quote. Already present in the Madeleine episode, this uh, um, feeling of disappointment, we remember maybe the last time we have been talking about the Madeleine episode, the feeling as such cannot be caught. It's disappointing and we have to imagine it again and again. It's only through imagination through a sort of hallucinatory uh, capacity to reproduce the feeling that you can get in touch with its strength. So already present in the Madeleine episode, the initially acute awareness of a separation between what is felt and what is represented becomes more marked as the plot progresses. For instance, as journeys, love affairs, and finally the whole Faubourg Saint-Germain fail to please, the state of disappointment becomes a kind of empty center around which what is felt and what is said continue to gravitate. This is, quote, our powerlessness in releasing ourselves through material enjoyment, through effectual action, end of the quote. So it is only through reproducing them, through a movement that is indeed telescopic, or more, more precisely metaphorical, metonymic, involving displacement and condensation. For instance, uh, if we refer to uh, the Madeleine episode, remember that there is a displacement from Mama to Aunt Leonie. And this displacement uh, helped Proust to build the metaphor, the Madeleine as a metaphor of disappointment and of enjoyment at the same time. So it is by this telescopic movement, which is more precisely metaphorical, metonymic, 
that through sensory experience will be produced or more exactly reproduced. Sensation must be recovered in the same time as time. It only arrives after the event. In terms of words, and against the grain with old sensations being renewed in the here and now and thus recreated. I quote, for I should have to execute the successive parts of my work in a succession of different materials, in a new and distinct material. This is very interesting. So I don't have to uh, find the sensation in itself. I have to execute it in another material. And this material is the imaginary material of a transparency and sonority that were special, compact, cool after warmth, rose pink. He tries to make us enjoy this new material in which we have to refine, it, recreate sensations. End of the quote. Produced by the assemblage of two words, which may be a perception soldered to an idea, or two perceptions and two ideas, or two representations with common essences, says he, this new material is none other than the fusion of analogy, the dynamic of analogy, the very stuff of metaphor. In a letter to Léon Daudet, dated November 27, 1913, quoted by Gérard Genette, Proust raises the prospect of a way of writing in which, he says, the supreme miracle would be accomplished, the transubstantiation of the irrational qualities of matter and life into human words. Uh, I have been, I think, already emphasizing on this uh, notion of transubstantiation used by Proust when I was uh, talking about Madeleine episode. Uh, but here we cross again this uh, Proustian notion, and I think it's very interesting because we have the same uh, reference to transubstantiation, to Catholic ritual, in Joyce's writing, when he refers to what style is. So, this way of writing, which is a transubstantiation on the crossroad between the reality of sensations and the imaginary of reproducing them into science, this way of writing is his own. For those who are willing to pay attention to its double lining of sensation, metaphor achieves the feat of transubstantiation dreamed of by the novelist. And for Proust, there is really a, a great accent put on the necessity of metaphor in the building up of uh, the novelistic style. He says, uh, in a quotation to which I'll come later, that as long as there is none of that metaphor, there is nothing. So the metaphor is the essential part of style. Now, the operation which Proust refers to as analogy or metaphor, uh, those are the words that he's using, has no connection with the same term as used by formalist rhetoric to designate the replacement, as you know, of a well-worn or abstract term by another which is unusual or strange, because this is the classical definition of a metaphor. We use another unusual or strange word in order to replace a well-worn or abstract one. Uh, well, in some sense, the Proustian sense of metaphor is equivalent to this <coughs> classical one, but the, uh, it's not exactly the same. It is much more like the reciprocal relationship, one of contradiction maintained between the two terms, which more recent authors have tried to reinstate in maintaining the ambivalence of metaphorical expression. For instance, the theories of metaphor by Richards or Blake, um, no, it's Black, uh, Black, yes, it's Methods and Metaphors, refer uh, more precisely uh, to this Christian um, usage of the term of metaphor because um, according to those writers metaphor is not only a replacement but uh, more exactly a contradiction maintained between the two terms a sort of tension of dynamics between the two terms and it's uh, closer to the Christian sense 
If we appreciate the way in which the double nature of science can be interiorized within the impression of memory, we can understand better how intense a form of condensation whose beliefs to be uh, the sine qua non to literature. And here I quote his uh, very famous definition of metaphor. Truth will be attained. We have all these quotations in French in um, the group of texts that have been given to you under the title of uh, uh, Theory of Metaphor. La Metaphor. La Metaphor, yes. Uh, all those quotations are there in French. You can go back maybe to them after the lecture. So this is the uh, quotation, which is the definition of metaphor uh, in the Le Temps Retrouvé, the last volume, number four. Truth will be attained by the writer only when he takes two different objects, states the connection between them, two objects, connection between them, a connection analogous in the world of art to the unique connection which in the world of science is provided by the law of causality. So analogy is the equivalent of causality into the world of sciences. And encloses them in the necessary links of a well-wrought style. Truth and life too can be attained by us only when by comparing a quality common to two sensations, here's again a definition of metaphor, by comparing a quality common to two sensations, we succeed in extracting their common essence and in reuniting them to each other, liberated from the contingencies of time within a metaphor. So metaphor brings together the common essences of two things, two representations, two impressions, and liberate them from the contingencies of time. We have what he calls a pure time. Metaphor is the way of reaching the pure time. A representation, for instance, of seascape by Elstir, who is the painter of uh, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, can only work as a metamorphosis it's even stronger than the metaphor. It's, it's called in this passage about uh, the uh, paintings by Elstir, uh, this, uh, this dynamic that it's referred to in other passages uh, as if it was a metaphorical one. Here it's referred to as if it was a metamorphosis. Not just a simple name by virtue of the substitu substitution of one name for another, the metaphor incarnate. The narrator observes, I quote, that the charm of each of the seascapes by a steer lay in a sort of metamorphosis of the objects represented, analogous to what in poetry we call metaphor, and that if God the Father had created things by naming them, it was by taking away their names or giving them other names that is still created then anew. The names which designate things correspond invariably to an intellectual notion, alien to our true impressions, and compelling us to eliminate from them everything that is not in keeping with that notion. We have already noted that Proust establishes an equivalence between the imagination of the artist and the creativity of life and nature. And I'll refer to this tomorrow when speaking to uh, the influence on uh, Proust of uh, uh, philosophers such as Schopenhauer uh, that also establish an equivalence between life on the one hand and uh, literature from the other. But let me say here that metaphor in its turn is just a way of becoming part of the continual waving of connections which takes place at the heart of living in the creative reality. Let us take note of two other features of this operation without which, as Proust puts it, there is nothing. The operation of metaphor, which is, as I said, contradiction, but also underlined by sensations and in this sense is a metamorphosis. Um, the connection brings together different objects by virtue of resemblances which the narrative detects in them. He superimposes, overprints one upon another, 
squeezing out the differences. In place of units, he establishes links. As a continuous linking together of circular elements, analogy has the effect of opening up the surface of science in the direction of depth, uh, la profondeur. This is the obsession of Proust. The uh, goal of the metaphor, this linking, this contradictions, this dynamics, this metamorphosis, uh, will have as essential go goal to open a depth. <coughs> as a creator of figures, the exponent of metaphor is like a geometrist, but in a more essential way, he is an X-ray operator and surgeon. He is compared, the writer is compared to a surgeon because he tries to go in the depth of the body of the nature. How does he work? How are the superimpositions affected? And what are the depths that they open up? In order to give you a um, concrete uh, example of this uh, uh, linking of metaphors going to a depth, I'll take uh, as an uh, example another episode from La Recherche, uh, which is the episode of the little phrase of Venteuil. Uh, Venteuil is the composer of La Recherche. I've already told about Elstir, who is the painter. Let me uh, emphasize a little bit on Venteuil, who is the composer. And there is a, a very uh, famous episode of La Recherche where Swann uh, hears the little phrase of Venteuil, and we have this in the uh, Xerox copies in the same part about metaphor. We can refer to it afterwards. Uh, let me try to analyze the metaphors in this little phrase episode, and we shall see how they are, from the one hand, contradictory, uh, maintaining tension, dynamics, and going to a metamorphosis and feeling, which is the real depth that Proust tries to uh, make us discover. The little phrase of Venteuil, which Swann hears again at uh, Madame Verdurin's house, what after having heard it the previous year, awakens a series of auditory sensations. With memory preparing the way, the little phrase is from the start endowed with the power of recollection, which anticipates the actual process of perception and gives rise to a whole range of pleasures which are expressed in a series of metaphors. Let's pay attention to this series of metaphors. The little phrase is first of all, I quote, slender but robust, compact and commanding, with the violin. And in the same time, and there is the first contradiction, I quote, a liquid rippling of sound, deep blue tumult of the sea, with the mass of the piano part, Valin Piano. On the one hand, slender, compact, and from the other hand, deep blue tumult of the sea. At the moment which follows the performance, the little phrase is, and there is another series of metaphor, again in contradiction with the first two, I quote, as the fragrance of certain roses wafted upon the moist air of the, we of the evening. The little phrase is confused, cinemateria. Yet immediately afterwards, Swan rediscovers its extend, its symmetrical arrangements, its notation, design, architecture, thought. So it was confused and now it's thought, design, architecture, which is not confused, which is on the contrary very precise. We have another link, a further connection is added to th this chain of links. When Swan returns home, he experiences the little phrase as, I quote, a woman he has seen for a moment passing by. A new analogy occurs to him. The little phrase opens up a possibility, quote, of rejuvenation. And far from restricting himself to a mere logical excursus over the keyboard of the five senses, Swan literally feels himself to be rejuvenated. 
and here is the metamorphosis. We go from metaphor to metaphor, and now he feels really rejuvenated. He's really transformed in his own sensations and in his own body. Metaphor has now become metamorphosis, a physical reality. The ramification of its fragrance leave on Swan's features, quote, the reflection of its smile. Finally, he finds out the name of this unknown woman or phrase. This is the Andante from Venter's Sonata for Piano and Violin. But over and beyond the name expressed in technical language, without any concern for analogy, the succession of these metaphors and metamorphoses is enough for Swan to fall in love with this piece of music, for it, it, uh, for, for it to become the national anthem of Odette and himself, for the East Feet to make the decision to marry Odette, while loving in her not so much the woman whom he no longer desires as a work of art, Botticelli's Zephora, and above all, the little phrase for which the young woman has henceforth become the metaphor, or more exactly, the metamorphosis. We can recall that the little phrase was, for a moment, analogous to a person. In the last analysis, and in an inverse way, Odette has become analogous to the little phrase. The series of metaphors moves in the other direction. Music is both woman and rejuvenation, and woman will be a rejuvenating wife only to the extent that she is confused with music. The imagination of the esthete and lover is required for this reciprocal metaphor to be fully forged, and I'll call this reciprocal metaphor because first uh, music was a woman uh, that uh, Swan has crossed in the street, and in final analysis, Odette becomes music. You have here uh, reciprocity in the movement of the metaphor. So the imagination of this thief and lover is required for this reciprocal metaphor to be fully forged, but this is only possible in so far as there has been a, co a coincidence between the analogy, loving music, loving a woman, and the contiguity Odette's presence at Swan's side while they listen to the little phrase in the Verdurin Salon. Proust seems to be drawn to metaphors which are reversible in this way and enable him to establish contiguity between analogies. He calls these effects alliterations, thus choosing to create yet another analogy drawn from the stock of rhetorical figures one which also expresses a form of coincidence between the analogous and the contiguous, as if he were insisting on the point that it is language play which forges and takes apart the linked chains of his eternal metaphors. In encountering Odette, the metamorphic adventures of the little phrase have not reached their close. A few pages later, Venteuil's Andante concludes by coming right up against the threat of mental illness, which is hanging over the composer. I quote, insanity diagnosed in a sonata seemed to Swan as mysterious a thing as the insanity of a dog or a horse, although instances may be observed of this, end of the quote. So the little phrase, which was in turns, you remember, commanding and liquid, fragrance of roses and notation, a woman passing by and a rejuvenation with the aim of marrying an Odette who has been absorbed by the music and made attractive again thanks to the reversal of the analogy, this little phrase comes to the end of its imaginary journeys from metaphor to metaphor by being evoked in author little phrase. Author's little phrase, which is a very strange one, insanity of a dog. This overprints 
both irradiate and contaminate each other. That's why I say that the metaphor in Proust does not only replace one image by the other, but all these uh, images are irradiating, they are over uh, printing themselves each over the other, depositing within each of the links of the chain the meaning of another one. By his analogical listening to music, Swan's physical love passes from confusion to sublimation and ensures its own survival. And yet the logic of Proustian overprinting already lends it a foretaste of the overfall, which is heading for a downfall with the divine tipping over into animal insanity. What is, what is it that binds these two extremes, the divine and the animal, together in an ultimate metaphorical link? Is it music itself, or Swan, or Odette? The question remains without an answer, for Proust's palimpsest overburdens the image, but far from annihilating it or emptying it out, it endows it with a dramatic, unsupportable, enigmatic polyphony. Uh, here I insist on the fact that this contradiction and overprinting of metaphors um, are not annihilating or emptying the meaning only. Uh, this position is Blanchot's position about uh, the uh, emptying out of the meaning in uh, Proustian text. I think that uh, this annihilating of the meaning through these contradictory metaphors is only a part of the process. Uh, but the essential part goes beyond this emptying out of the meaning and endows it with a dramatic, unsupportable and enigmatic polyphony. Uh, and I'll try to show this by further comments. Later on, the hearing of the same Venteuil sonata at Madame de saint Verde's evening party will succeed in confirming these initial metaphorical intimations of uh, something which is animal and uh, conferring the sense of death, of insanity, of uh, downfall. Why? Swan discerns in the sonata the charms of an intimate sadness, he says, their very essence for all that it consists of being incommu incommunicable. Musical form which is, he says, hostile to any form of reasoning, but as we have seen, permeable to metaphor, achieves the status of actual ideas of another world, of another order, ideas veiled in shadow, unknown, impenetrable to the human mind, and reveals to him that Odette's love for him is already dead. And he says this, this is a quote from the Proustian text, from that evening onwards, Swann understood that the feeling which Odette had once had for him would never revive. No more would his love for her. What was it but an impression, a transposition? And he says again, to think that I have wasted years of my life, that I have longed to die, that I have experienced my greatest love for a woman who didn't appeal to me, who wasn't even my type. So the idea of an error, of a lost and dead love has been already there in the first uh, contact with um, this uh, Odette uh, love in uh, the hearing of the sonata in the Verdurin's house when the metaphor of animal insanity has been uh, imprinted in the chain of the other rejuvenated metaphors. But only in the end of the events between Swan and Odette will this uh, death uh, instinct or death uh, goal of their relationship appear. Uh, it has been already there in the metaphors, but it will become evident a little bit later. Uh, let me uh, say some other things about uh, the uh, construction of the metaphor. 
uh, as we have already seen it in the Proustian text, and then we have uh, stopped before uh, making some projection uh, slides in order to find out how Proust imagined the depth that the metaphor uh, is supposed to reveal. But let me, uh, before uh, the break, emphasize to the metonymy uh, in the narrative framework and the role of the metonymy in the Proustian metaphors. The prevalence of metaphor in this imaginative world that I have uh, uh, emphasized today establishes connections which are purely metonymic. Uh, Stephen Ullman, that had analyzed uh, Proustian style, had already pointed out uh, this fact. These figures rely upon the proximity of two sensations. Christian metaphors rely on the proximity of two sensations. We have seen that 